Please welcome our moderator, President and CEO of Mizuho Securities USA, John S. Kudunas. With our distinguished panel, former President Felipe Calderon, the United Mexican States, former President Sebastian Piñera, the Republic of Chile, and former President Alvaro Uribe, the Republic of Colombia. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I want to start out by uh, saying that Latin America is a word that is uh, described by a lot of the media as one unit. But essentially, there's a lot of different cultural issues and economic issues that surround that region. And uh, for example, growth in the last year has been down, on average, a significant amount, but there's some outliers, such as Colombia. So um, if you're looking to invest, and from a business point of view, it presents a lot of challenges, but also opportunities. Opportunities if you're able to understand the different countries' landscapes. So we are fortunate today to have three past presidents of Mexico, Chile, and Colombia, and hopefully we can discuss some of the similarities and the differences in how it pertains to this year's summit and the theme. So let's start out by speaking with President Calderon and asking him a question. Most recently, there's been a signed energy, a new energy reform bill that has opened up the borders significantly to outside companies for oil and gas fields. How do you feel this has changed Mexico's economy and its environmental changes, challenges that takes place with that? Well, uh, I was listening a little bit the, the previous uh, session uh, related with uh, the revolution of shale gas and shale oil in the United States. And all the good things that you have listened are going to pass exactly in Mexico. Because the energy reform is allowing to private investment by first time in 70 years to go to explore and exploit natural gas, oil, upstream and all downstream, and refinery, transportation, petrochemical, and that will imply a huge change in the Mexican economy with an incredible potential, not only in investment, and productions, which implies a very strong impact to the economic performance of the country, but also in competitiveness. Let me tell you that Mexico has the sixth largest natural, sixth largest reserve in natural gas in the world. And that will contribute to provoke, to provoke this independence, if I can say that, autonomy uh, so sources of energy for North, North America as a whole in probably four or six years. Second, it will increase the competitiveness of the economy. We made a set of reforms already, basically opening the, the economy even more, which it provided a lot of competitiveness for industry. When I took office, Mexico was this, the ninth largest exporter of vehicles in the world. Nine, now is the fourth largest exporter of vehicles in the world, surpassing the UK, Spain, even the United States as exporter. And now with this reform, having the cheapest natural gas in the, in the world, in this region, that will foster the competitiveness of Mexican economy. So I, I would say that this reform will have a very promising future for the country. And uh, is there any implication related with environment? Probably yes, but we need to explore that. I was quite interested in the conversation we had, or we, we have listening. Uh, we need to fix that issue related with the intensive use of water in, in, in these fracking processes. I am a geologist, but I'm very sure that the industry will find a way in which you can overcome any potential damages for the environment. The other is long term, is more related with more controversial, related with climate issue. But even though this discussion that we need to have one day, natural gas will be the transitional fuel for a new era. I mean. Natural gas could reduce the emission in the way that could phase out the use of coal, which is the most damaging to the environment. And natural gas, again, will be this transitional path to get a new era on that. So very promising future for Mexico coming from that reform. Thank you. President Pineda, um, 
mining is probably one of the largest and most significant industries in, uh, in your country, in Chile. Back in August of 2010, uh, the, the whole world was watching when we had the coal miners stuck and uh, everybody was tuned in on the TV and you were there for the whole time. Um, a lot of that has to do with public and private sector as well um, in terms of the whole economy and the heart and soul of the country. If you can tell us what you were feeling and some of the consequences that happened during that time, I think uh, I know myself very interested about that moment being uh, locked on a TV screen and watching it. I'm sure the audience would be very interested to hear your view. Thank you, John. Hello, Felipe, Alvaro. It's a pleasure to be with you and share this audience today. Well, I remember that episode with a great deal of emotion. I was meeting with President Correa in Ecuador when I heard the news that in the very small mine in the driest desert of the world, a huge accident took place and 33 miners were stuck 2,300 feet down the earth below tons and tons of rocks. I remember I was on my way to Colombia because it was the inauguration ceremony when President Uribe was yielding uh, the administration to President Santos. And I remember I met with you, and I told you I, would not, I was not going to stay for the ceremony because I felt that I had to come back to Chile. And I, and I came back, and on my way back, I called four presidents, the president of the United States, Peru, Australia, and Canada, asking them for help what kind of technology, knowledge, people, equipment, whatever, they could provide us in order to be able and to be successful in our challenge, not only to find them, but also to rescue them. And on my way back to Chile, I stopped at that mine. I remember that two of my ministers told me not to go there because it was really a desperate situation with very little hope. But I said, look, this is a time when you have to prove that you are really committed to life and that you have faith and hope and you will be able to unite the whole country as a real crusade in order to find them and rescue them. So I went to the mine and I met for the first time with the families, their wives, mothers, sons, daughters, fathers. And they were so desperate because the situation at that time was very, very difficult one. Nobody know, knew where they were. We didn't know whether they were alive or dead. We thought that they didn't have air and water. And everybody was so desperate that they were waiting for one answer. So the only commitment I could make at that time was look, and looking at the face, at their eyes, we would look for them as if they were our own sons. And I went back to Santiago and received some uh, help from, from these four countries I had called before. And we organized the search first, which lasted for 17 days. For 17 days, we were looking for them, but blindly. We didn't know where they were. We didn't know where they were dead or alive. And we were just digging those holes. Mm -hmm. And the miners told us afterward that they heard the drills going through the walls, and they thought, as it is the mining tradition, that after four days, we will put 33 flags in the surface. And that was it. But our commitment was, look, we will look for them as if they were our own sons. And so we kept looking for them, using all kinds of technology and receiving a lot of support from many countries. Among them, Mexico also helped us in this uh, crusade. And after 17 days, we finally got the news that they were alive, all of them, at the bottom of that mine. It took us more than two months to rescue them. But it was such a, a, a unifying factor in our country because everybody was really united. And the partnership between the public and the private sector was so genuine and so powerful mm, that really it was good for the soul 
of Chile. After that, the Chileans realized that united we can achieve big goals. And to finish, Chile was the poorest Spanish colony and now has become the country with the highest per capita income, $20,000. But our target, and I, I always remind the minor effort, is to become a developed country and defeat poverty before the end of this decade. And therefore, we, you have to put goals and try to commit people behind those goals. And the minor experience was a very good one to prove to the Chilean people and to the world that when you act united, united and with strong faith and commitment, you can achieve goals that many people thought were impossible. Thank you. President Erebe, during your presidency in Colombia, you increased the security tremendously. And what that allowed also give the confidence for foreign investment to come into your country. My question to you is, you know, what did that do in terms of the ability to hire people, job creation, and equality? Thank you, John. It is a great honor to chair this panel with President Calderon and President Piñera. And I want to congratulate Matthew and Nicholas for this excellent endeavor of Concordia. Colombia has been the longest democracy all over Latin America and the Caribbean. In the last century, the country had only four years of democratic interruption. For we should not speak on a confrontation between insurgents and dictators. This has not been the case of Colombia. My country has suffered a narco-terrorist challenge against the rule of law. After the year 2002, we introduced a policy based on three elements, security, but security with democratic freedoms, security for every Colombian, security for those in line with the government and for those in the opposition. We call it democratic security, investment confidence, with many decisions we make, and at the same time, social cohesion. You ask about jobs, income distribution. The country began first to stop the growth of poverty, and in the middle of many difficulties, the financial crisis of the year uh, 2008, the closeness of the Venezuelan market, and the collapse of the pyramids of narco-trafficking in Colombia, we brought uh, poverty from 53 to 37. At this moment, it is around 30 percent. The country had an unemployment rate between 16 and 21. At the end of our administration, it was around 11. Now it is, roughly speaking, around in between 8 and 9. The country has increased social policies. but. Uh, when speaking on Colombia, it is very important to know that in the second half of the last century, many governments reduced extreme poverty. The country was doing well. And the country began to suffer a lot and to stop making progress. At the moment, narco-trafficking and all the groups of narco-traffickers began to increase their activities. Therefore, we need to consider that there is one question for us. What has been the main cause? Terrorist groups, the main cause of the Colombian problems, or poverty? In my opinion, the terrorist groups. 
because of the policies that were introduced before my administration in the absence of terrorist groups, Colombia would have overcome poverty long ago. Thank you. I'm going to want to, uh, at some point, take questions from the audience. I have a tablet here. So uh, you have any questions, please put it on there. I'll choose a few as, as we go forward. I want this to be a little bit more interactive. At this point, I want to ask a, a question that any of uh, you can uh, kind of jump in. Uh, being that I work uh, at Mizuha, which is one of the largest Japanese banks, uh, one of the issues that uh, comes to mind for us is TPP, Trans-Pacific Pipeline. And um, it spans from Japan to Chile. And uh, my question is, what are some of the obstacles that you think are uh, involved? And do you think, uh, you know, what are some of the positive things going forward if this takes place? And I can open it up to, uh, to any of you. Age for beauty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, let me tell you first that uh, we share some kind of uh, good decisions, I would say, in the region. You know very well that Latin America, our love region, is uh, split, if I can say that, or divided in different ways, different ways in which we understand politics and economy and democracy. There is a group of countries dominated by Mercosur in economic terms and ALBA in political terms, headed by Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, etc. And there are other countries, I would say, probably a very important part of the rest of Latin America, in which we believe in free market, private investment, democracy, and freedom. So, uh, curiously, Mercosur was founded in order to open up the borders and to generate one single big market. And we, we, three of us, when we were president, plus the president of Peru, we founded the Pacific Alliance, which is more or less the same idea of a TPP. It's a big agreement related with trade among the countries that are looking towards the Pacific Sea. And in these four countries, now we have much more exports than the rest of Latin American countries. And I believe that it is clear for us the potential of economic growth in the world is in the Pacific Sea, it's in the Pacific Basin. We understood that, and we, instead of make the, one of the capital sins of Latin America, which is to become very protectionism and start to expropriate and everything, which is actually, the, it's, it's a nightmare uh, in, the, in our history, we open our borders, we start to sign free trade between us, and we are looking to the sea because we know that the economic growth will be from Japan to Australia, and from Mexico or even Canada towards Chile in the Pacific Sea. So TPP, the main obstacle that could have is the protectionist interest in each country, including the United States. But we are, we, when we founded the Pacific Alliance, we were thinking exactly that. The prosperity that my fellow presidents were talking about, the prosperity of our people, and we understand that free trade will deliver that kind of prosperity, allowing people, producers and consumers, to pick uh, the materials, the products, the services they need, and uh, of course, opening up the opportunities for more investment in our region. That's the way in which we saw the Pacific Alliance, and I believe, in my point of view, that's the way in we are looking the opportunities behind the TPP. It's a good movement. Pacific Alliance was a good movement. TPP will be a good one as well. And we need to open our minds and our borders to free trade in the world, and that's the way in which we can recover part of the growth we, we have lost in the last probably five or six years. President Pinera. Well, I fully agree with what Felipe has told us. And let me tell you, Felipe and Alvaro were key players in the creation of the Pacific Alliance. Because as Felipe said, Latin America has always been a continent of hope. We have everything, vast territories, very generous natural resources. We haven't had wars like Europe. 
We don't have a religious or tribal conflicts like uh, Europe or Africa, but we haven't been able to take full advantage of our potentiality. Latin America is still an underdeveloped continent with 33% of its population living in poverty. And that's not a God design. It's because we have not been able to take full advantage of all these uh, capabilities that we have. And in Latin America, we have three kinds of groups of countries. You have the Mercosur, where there is a lot of uh, government intervention. There is a mistrust of, of public uh, enterprise and public initiative. And on the other hand, you have the ALBA countries, which are very ideologized. How do you say it? Ideologize. Ideologize. And therefore, we said, look, why don't we try to create an alliance? These countries, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, we have so many things in common. We really believe in democracy, the rule of law, the separation of power, freedom, uh, free markets, openness. And at the same time, of course, we are fully committed with reducing poverty and reducing income inequalities. And therefore, we created this alliance only three years ago. I remember it was in Paranal, a, 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 a place very close to the heaven in the northern part of Chile where all the observatories are, where we signed this agreement. And basically it was to create not only a free trade agreement or free trade zone in terms of goods and services, but free movement of capital, free movement of people, real integration between us. But not to close our frontiers to the world, but just the opposite, to open our frontiers to the world and maybe also undertake a joint effort in order to take advantage of all these opportunities that the Asia-Pacific market was providing us. And it has been extremely successful. These four countries together will be the ninth or eighth or ninth largest economy in the world. They represent more than 50% of Latin American trade, only uh, around one-third of Latin American output, or GMP. But we have been able to move forward Trusting in freedom, trusting what free markets can do. We are not trying to say you will do this and you will do that, which has been the capital scene of the former or previous integration process, where the bureaucrats will join together and try to split or distribute production between countries. This has been absolutely free. We are creating the conditions, but of course, Public and public, uh, private entrepreneurs have to take advantage of this, and it has been extremely successful. Our trade between us has grown significantly, and we are also increasing our trade with the rest of the world. And here comes the TPP, because the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and Mexico is part of that, and we are also part of that, and we hope that Colombia will become part of the TPP very soon, is an effort to enlarge that free trade zone, taking into account the whole Pacific Basin, both sides of the Pacific Ocean, which represent almost 50% of world GMP. And if you take into account what is happening with the Doha Round and the World Trade Organization, which is stuck, maybe the best way to move towards free trade is with these multilateral free trade zone agreements like the TPP and also the Atlantic Alliance between the US and Europe, which is something that is also moving on. So I think that if you take into account the results, because you can, of course, you can believe in anything you want and you are free to choose your own way, but if you examine and evaluate the results, of course, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile are growing at a much faster pace than the rest of the continent, M much at a much faster pace than the Mercosur countries. So I think that at least for us, is the right way to overcome underdevelopment and defeat poverty. And we have been able to move so fast because we, we share the same principles. It's not an ideological discussion like they are in UNASUR or MERCOSUR where we talk about imperialism. And, and uh, here we are really much more pragmatic. How can, what can we do ourselves? Not to blame the rest of the world. What can we do? as president of our country to improve the quality of life of our people. And that has been the main uh, driving force of the Pacific Alliance. And I would like to, to emphasize the key role that President Calderon and President Uribe played in the creation of the Pacific Alliance. 
something to add. The Pacific Alliance, the arc of the Pacific, as we call it at the very beginning, when you consolidate the size of the economies of the partners, you will find a, an economy of that size and with a much more robust economic growth than the economy of the United Kingdom. It uh, means to you the importance in economic terms of this alliance. Regardless the geographical location, on the Pacific or on the Atlantic or on the Caribbean, it is much more important the common values shared by these countries, their affirmative action on behalf of the rule of law. These countries share their commitment for security, for private investors, for social cohesion, for independent institutions, and for pluralistic people participation. And it makes a significant contrast, for instance, with Venezuela. Venezuela is a typical case, and I am a, a supporter of the opposition in Venezuela. Venezuela is a typical case showing that it, that it is impossible to sustain social policies without trust on the side of private investors that the more you eliminate the rule of law, the more the violence grows in the country. The success of the Alliance of the Pacific, in my opinion, depends on many aspects, internal aspects to our countries, on the ability of our countries to overcome problems of security, in the case of Mexico and Colombia. Chile has enjoyed a level of security comparable with the European nations. My country needs a, a government with the ability to restore security that has been deteriorated in the years to come. And my country to succeed within the Alliance for the Pacific needs that the government and the Colombian community made a determination to defeat terrorism and not to surrender to terrorist groups in order to destroy the rule of law. It is very important that success inside the Pacific Alliance depends much more on our own governments than on the external community. Thank you. Before I get to answer, uh, asking some of the questions from the audience, and there's some good ones here, I have one more I want to I want to put out there. Uh, if I look at the history, uh, all three of the presidents overlapped at the same time. Um, is there any examples, any anecdotes that you want to say where you collaborated amongst the three of you together in some P3 function? I think, it, I think it, the Pacific Alliance is the best example of collaboration, clearly. Uh, and of course, uh, well, we can talk about other issues. For instance, the summits that we had at the Latin American region, you can imagine those kind of summits <laughs> <laughs> with very long speeches, seriously like two hours instead of 10 minutes. And very different visions about the region, about the world. Uh, it's like sometimes what well, like surreal, un underrealistic or surrealistic issue, or the Latin American. It, it, it looks like it was not a question of politics; it was a question of literature or something like that. No, and we had a lot of coincidences there. We were together even without saying we. Finally, we, we were like uh, presidents, that, as my fellow presidents say, we shared values and principles. And for us, it, it was very, very difficult to push for them in the region. And at the same time, it was difficult to overcome the situation, at least in the case of Mexico. In, the, in, in this particular issue, it was 
some differences because Mexico suffered the most, if I can say that, that the consequences of the global recession, in particular because the American economy fell down in 2008, 2009, and fell down exactly over us. <laughs> so the elephant went down and we were uh, at the bottom of the elephant. So, uh, But uh, for us, uh, we always had the support of the people of Colombia and Chile in particular. We always have attention about the crisis, crisis we suffer, for instance, the H1 and 1, and always I had the support. So we were a team, I can say that, and uh, that thing worked very well, and I hope that could be replied in the future for other presidents. Well, I think the Pacific Alliance is the strongest example of what collaboration can achieve. Because, as I said before, it's not only that we were, at, we, we were able to achieve free trade agreements, real free trade agreements, with oh, up, oh, almost no exception in our trade of goods and services, but also we integrated our capital markets, our stock exchanges. We opened our frontiers to free movement of capitals, free movement of people, so it's a real integration. It's, it's, it, it goes beyond just a commercial free trade agreement. But there is something else I would like to emphasize. Because as Felipe said, in Latin America, we have a very ideological debate when we start discussing what can we do, I mean, we have to hear long speeches about imperialism and that everything is happening in Latin America has to be blamed on the US or Europe or whatever. So I think that the fact that we realized that we were sharing very key principles and values, because at, at the end of the day, what are the pillars that you need in order to become a developed country? The old pillars, which are necessary but not enough, stable democracy, strong rule of law, free, open, competitive market economy, a sound economic policies and macroeconomic equilibrium. Those were values that we shared from the very beginning and therefore we were able to stick to them very strongly in the middle of a continent where those values are very weak or are being strongly opposed. But there is something new that we have to add to these pillars, which are the new pillars of development in this new society of knowledge and information. And again, here we found a very strong agreement from the very first moment. First of all, to improve the quality of our human capital, which means not only to improve the quality and coverage of education, but also of training, because most of our working force will never come back to the formal educational process, to strengthen and promote entrepreneurship and innovation, which sometimes is a dirty word in Latin America, to triple our investment rate in science and technology, to do a strong effort to defeat poverty and to uh, obtain a better equality of opportunity, to improve also the quality of our demo democracy and our, in our institutions and our state. So I would say that in all those areas, which are the old and the new pillars that will have to be built or strength in order to be able to become a developed countries, we found a very strong natural alliance between these four countries. So that's another area where collaboration, which is, is very important because you understand that you're not alone, that really you are pushing values which are shared by other countries, particularly in the continent of Latin America where the, those values are not shared by the ALBA countries, and I don't know if they are really shared by the Mercosur countries. So I, that was another uh, area where collaboration was extremely useful and, uh, and, very, and very efficient. The transversal democratic values shared by our countries, plus the spirit of cooperation, are the main causes for the appearance of the Alliance for the Pacific. We had uh, great experiences in cooperation with Mexico and with Chile, with President Calderón and with President Peña Nieto. We worked together against the terrorist groups, the narco-terrorist groups. President Calderón set a very positive e example 
of courage and determination. We President Piñeras and his predecessors, we negotiated free trade agreements, the agreement to drop double taxation, and the agreement to, for bilateral um, assurances for investors. We have to cooperate among our countries and inside every country to move the cooperation among the private sector, the public sector, and the non-profit organizations. Let me give you this example. Latin American and the Caribbean as a whole, they have almost 600 million people, very young people, 27, 28, average age, but with a very high rate of youth unemployment. Very high rate. Chile, 17. Mexico, 9%. I cannot understand my country in between 18 and 21. Young population with high rate of youth unemployment. We need education job-relevant education. And it is possible only with the cooperation among the public sector, the private sector, and the non-profit organizations. If the government of my country calls any banker and says to him, I need you to bring to Colombia a venture capital fund for enterprises of youngsters. Maybe the answer will be, no, we cannot. But if the government invites private bankers in the country, in the international community, to undertake a partnership to provide youngsters with venture capital funds in order for them to create their own possibilities these partnerships are possible. Therefore, we need to cooperate. And the case of the youth unemployment is a case of necessary illustrating the necessity of this kind of cooperations, the P3, as it is called here in the Concordia Index. All right, here's a question from the audience. Why do you think the political pendulum in Latin America is swinging now to the left and less willing to embrace private sector and PPPs? Could you repeat, please? Why do you think the political pendulum in Latin America is swinging to the left and is less likely to and willing to embrace private and public sector? Uh, I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, of course, current situation is that a lot of governments became leftist government, and not only leftist, that is not a problem, but very populist, uh, anti-private uh, government. And it, well, it was like a wave that happened in Latin America that is very related with a lot of prejudice we have in ideological terms. We were educated, as President Piñera talked about the anti-American spirit, for instance, of our fellow presidents in ALBA. Let me say, we in Mexico and probably in several countries in Latin America, we were educated, educated like, I'm sorry to say that, like, like a, hating the Americans, you know? like blaming them. They took our territory. They are, this culture is coming from, and it's, it's inside our educational system. So it's a big problem. And it is important to realize that foreign policy of the United States should address this issue. That's another issue. But now, what is happening in our countries? Those governments are not exactly passing a very good time. The worst case probably, uh, with the exception of Cuba, but the worst case could be Venezuela. Venezuela, people is, are suffering a lot. Hyperinflation, scarcity, insecurity, and the, gov the people is not exactly supporting the government. Other countries, Argentina, you can see the problems they are, taking, they are having right now. There will be elections next year. Probably there will be a change, and the people will abandon the leftist government. There will be elections next week in Brazil. Now it's neck-to-neck -neck elections, but uh, 
The problem is the experiment related with populism or protectionism, even though in a so strong economy like the Brazilian one, is disappointing a lot of people. So what is the main support of these fellows we have related with government? My opinion is the main support they have had the last decade was the price of commodities. We all are very big supporters of commodities, yes. But again, in the case of Latin American countries related with Pacific Alliance, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, etc., our economies... We had et cetera. No, no, sorry, Chile. No, my friend. <laughs> Peru, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and a lot of others. We have more aggregated value in our economies. Let me take my case in order to not make any mistake anymore. But in Mexico in the 80s, the 80% of our export were oil, oil related now is less than 18%. And in the case of uh, Pacific Alliance countries, we are exporting like 55% of our export are manufactured products. In the case of Mercosur, is less than 25%. Of course, there was a big event at the beginning of, of this century, which is the entrance of China in the, in the World Trade Organization. China became the big buyer of everything. And that was one of the reasons that the price of commodities went up dramatically. If you are a big producer of cattle, which is the case of Argentina, or the big, a big producer of soja and oil, which is the case of Brazil, or a big producer of oil, which is the case of Venezuela, and you are depending exclusively on that, when you have the windfall of this price of commodities, you, do, you can do great. However, the price of commodities went down two years or three years ago, and now Brazil is in recession and now Argentina is suffering, and now Venezuela is suffering. Yes, we have in our basket such kind of products, but we have more aggregated value. And that is the reason Brazil, uh, sorry, Brazil is, fall, is falling down right now. Chile has been always a great economy, especially when, when Sebastián was the president. Colombia is now, you mentioned it, uh, extraordinary performance in the economy. In my opinion is, because they realize a lot in this windfield of the price of commodities. And that supported the leftist government, and they can do a lot of crazy things because the people was feeling very good. But now things are changing, and there will be, I hope, I think, I'll say, in the next election, very soon. Well, this is a very special year because we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the First World War the 75th anniversary of the of the of the D-Day, the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union, but at the same time we are living or we are experiencing some ends of very strong and durable cycles. The end of the uh, commodity cycle, the super prices of the commodity cycle, the end of the super expansionary monetary policy in the U.S., the end of the super borrowing policy in the U.S., the end of the super growth of China. So now we will have to prove again that we cannot rely only on those strong winds. Now why the pendulum is going left, which is true. I think that populist candidate can be very popular, but populist president cannot remain popular. And therefore, when countries are going in the right direction, which is the case of Mexico and, and, and Colombia and Chile, we, many times we are caught in what is called the middle income trap, which basically, how many countries have been able to defeat and develop in the last 50 years? Only a few. From the 60 to our times, so only a few countries have been able to defeat and develop and poverty. Singapore, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, and a few others. Most of them have be, been trapped in what is called the middle income trap. Because when you are doing fine, people start to ask everything, which is the case in many of our countries. So they, they want to, be, to, to, to leave us if we were a developed country, and, but we are still in our way to become a developed country. So I think that populism has been a very strong and powerful enemy of sound policies in Latin America. And of course, that's something that happens in many, many other countries. But I think that the Latin America will realize very soon that there are some patterns that really work 
and will conduct us toward development. Another pattern that will stack us in underdevelopment poverty. And therefore, since we are having new elections in many of these countries, I think that the pendulum will not stay where it is now, it will come back. But normally what happens is that sound, serious, and responsible government, what they do, they have to take, in, to, 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 uh, take and, and correct the mess that many times we inherited from previous government. And once you have done that and the economy is growing, again, they come back promising everything, and that's something which is still very attractive for many people. But education, I think, is a key aspect for that. Because when people become more educated, they start to be able to, to distinguish mm, much clearly what works and what doesn't work. But I hope that this pendulum, which, I mean, in the 80s, most of Latin American countries were dictatorships. It was during the 80s and the 90s that most of our country became democratic countries. Now we are in a, in a middle situation because I think that democracy, the rule of law, and many other things are at risk in countries like Venezuela, or even more than at risk. But at the same time, as Felipe was saying, many of these populist governments, they were very lucky because they received all these revenues from the super cycle of commodity prices. And now they will have to, to realize that they cannot blame everything on the rest of the world, which is something so typical in, in countries like Venezuela, for instance. So I hope that Latin America will finally learn from its own lessons, learn from our own mistake, and understand that the only way to be able to overcome underdevelopment and poverty is really to stick to these basic principles. Not only the old pillars, as I said before, democracy, market economy, but also we have to do a huge reforms in terms of providing good quality education to everybody, to invest more in science and technology, to promote and not be all the time against innovation and entrepreneurship. And those things, I think, are beginning to happen in many Latin American countries. So I'm very optimistic about the future. The, the question is, what are the reasons for the people misperception of the private sector in Latin America? There could be many Ideolog ideological speeches, the export of the Cuban model, at the same time poverty. In my country, the main reason has been the outcome of the narco-terrorist groups. They have stop the private sector from advancing, from growing faster to solve social problems. In Latin America, we need, through education and the creation of opportunities for small enterprises and enterprises uh, with uh, uh, youngsters' initiatives, we need to create a new perception of the private sector. Today, many people think in the region that private initiative is uh, an exclusive freedom. We need to convert it into an inclusive freedom for the necessity of job-relevant education. In my country, the political determination exists, but there are two problems, the deterioration of security. And in every country in Latin America, as my country, should rethink the amount of public expenses and at the same time, the amount of taxes. I have seen in the region a lot of regulations, a lot of public expenses that are not notorious because of the boom of commodities. And the ways uh, some of our countries are looking for to solve these problems is to maintain the enormous size of public expenses and to levy an enormous amount of new taxes. It will be totally inconvenient for the region. And the more we stop the private sector, the less the results 
the social resolve of the private sector, and the more the misperception of our people regarding the private economy. Thank you. I know it's showing that we don't have any very little time left, but I'm going to try to squeeze one more question in because I know that there's a lot of uh, investors, uh, in, institutional investors in the audience, and one of the questions is, other than energy and transportation, what are some of the other industries that sh foreign investors should be looking to invest in opportunities? Well, in the case of Mexico, it's full of opportunities, I would say. <laughs> so Mexico will be the fifth or the sixth largest economy or the fifth or sixth largest market in the world by the year 20 2050. Uh, according with the reform, we were talking about the huge opportunities in energy, natural gas, oil, petrochemical, uh, transportation, full of opportunities in telecom, because the new law will promote, I hope, real competitiveness in the sector and uh, real competition as well. There are huge opportunities related with manufacturing industry in Mexico. Mexico is already competitive, as I say, the example of the vehicles. And I would say is the country who received the most investment in aerospace industry, for instance, during four years. Uh, it's very competitive. Uh, and today, labor market, for instance, in Mexico, in two years, according to the Boston Consulting Group, will be as competitive as Chinese market in labor. If you add on, on top of that, natural price, natural gas prices, which is the most competitive in the world, will be. If you add as well uh, the access to the United States and uh, this set of free trade agreements, Mexican products will be among the most competitive in the world in industry, manufacturing. So that's full of opportunities on that. Infrastructure. We have the right law, we have the right environment, and we have, and I would say the same with Colombia, for instance, or Chile. Our countries need a lot of infrastructure investment to our growing countries, and we have the right um, uh, pro-business environment to do that. So you want to make money, go to invest, to Mexico, to Colombia, and to Chile, of course. <laughs> okay. Finance as well, finance. Well, I can't be less. In Chile, we have even more opportunity than in Mexico. <laughs> well, basically, both, all of our countries are very open countries. For instance, Chile and Mexico, we have free agreement with almost 80% of the world GMP. And Colombia is moving in the same direction. So it's not only the opportunities within the country. I would say also the opportunities within the Pacific Alliance and the opportunity from the Pacific Alliance to really be able to to integrate to the rest of the world. But if I had to mention one area, we are not really uh, very keen in trying to pick up the winners. We think that that's something that has to be done by the private sector. But where I think are the most interesting opportunity in all of our country, particularly in Chile, to add value to our natural resources. To add value, more value added within our countries. In the Energy sector, for instance, in Chile, we have the, the is one of the countries, in, in Mexico, they have a lot of tail gas and oil. In Chile, we have the most powerful potential in terms of solar energy, because we have the most powerful radiance in our northern deserts. And that's clean energy, renewable energy, but we need not, not, not only a financial resources, because we have that. What we need is really joint ventures, technology, investment in the energy sector, and also add value in other very important sectors in Chile, like mining sector. Chile is a mining country. Also in the uh, wood and pamper, fishing, and all the natural resources in terms of adding value in order to be able to satisfy more sophisticated and demanding ca ca consumer around the world. But the most important thing, I think, is that in all of the three countries, you will face a real rule of law. Basically, the rules are stable, the rules are applied in, in, in an impersonal way. We are not countries where you have to bribe everybody in order to do anything, and we are not countries where we are changing the rules all the time. So these are very reliable countries and full of opportunities. So don't wait. I urge you to stand up 
and start making those investments in our countries. By the year uh, 2030, the world will need to increase the supply of food by 50 percent, the supply of energy by 40, and the supply of potable water by 40. Latin America has all the sources of energy. 26 percent of the arable land in the planet. All the possibilities to produce agriculture and um, to advance in the food industry. Latin America has 50 percent of the soft water reserves in the world. And at the same time, 57 percent of the remaining rainforest in the world. Latin America has all the possibilities. Here in New York, everything is done. In Latin America, everything is to be done, for we need you there. Well, I'd like to thank Concordia for this opportunity to uh, moderate this very, very prestigious panel. And uh, I hope that uh, the audience and everybody got as much out of it as I did. Uh, thank you very, very, very much to all the presidents for coming here and supporting us. As a member of the Leadership Council, we really appreciate uh, all that you've done. And uh, thank you very much. How about a big round of applause?